Okay. Yeah? All right.
गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन आई रिक्वेस्ट ऑल ऑफ यू टू काइंडली टेक योर रिस्पेक्टिव सीट्स आई वेलकम यू ऑल वंस अगेन एंड वी बिगिन दिस सेशन विद अ प्रोफेशनल डेवलपमेंट टॉक बाय डॉक्टर डैन क्रिशनसन द प्रोडक्ट मैनेजर टॉपिका फोटोनिक्स आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट हुमेरा टू काइंडली टेक ओवर द माइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस डॉक्टर क्रिशनसन Um, Dr. Dan Christensen is a product manager of Toptica Photonics. Dr. Dan has done his PhD from the University of Rochester. He was the OSA ambassador in 2018, and he has been a part of various committees as a leader. Dr. Dan has four publications and one book chapter in his name. He has designed a microscope solution to meet the needs of specific biological problems, and has ten years of hands-on experience in designing, aligning, and testing. opto mechanical systems in 2014 he received the new clome cleveland prize which is an award presented to authors of an outstanding paper published in research articles or report sections of science without further ado i now call upon dr dan christensen to share his thoughts on the path into industry and an insight into professional development okay can you hear me Yeah. Okay. Good. It's nice when things work right away the first time. Which, if you were watching, is not what happened with the computer. But so hopefully the computer behaves for us while we're up here today. All right, thank you for that very, very kind introduction. It's always uh, it's always kind of funny to hear that introduction, only because I've I have not been researching in the academic lab. I haven't been building microscopes for a good. On five and a half, six years now, I've, I've been in industry for the past uh, five and a half, six years, working on completely different projects, uh, helping to design laser systems and working with customers and doing that that side of the the process. But uh, whenever whenever I hear that introduction, it reminds me of of building those microscopes and working in academia, and it, it makes me long for it a little bit, only because there's such a an excellence and such a a joy that comes with with designing something and see it work. Maybe for the first time ever. So let me let me start with this. Let me get to know you a little bit, since I haven't gotten to know really hardly any of you yet so far. I just I just flew in this morning. I just got here like two hours ago. Uh, so I've only met a few of you. Hopefully, I'll, I'll meet all of you by in, in the next couple of days. I'll be here until Monday, so I'll be here through Monday. I'll be with you tomorrow and everything. So how many of you are bachelor's level students? Okay. How many of you are masters? How many of you are PhD? And how many of you are past PhD? All right. You see, there's like a natural progression. The bachelor students are in the front. <laughs> the masters are in the middle. The PhDs in the back. That's kind of funny. All right. <laughs> okay. I don't. I don't know a conclusion to draw from that. Okay. Um, As was said in the introduction, uh, I am, I'm a product manager at Topsico. What that means, action of the products that we do, it means that I, I help with the marketing. It means that I have to I have to talk with a lot of people. I have to do a lot of research, not on the not on the like uh, scientific side, but I do a lot of research on the people side. What products do people need? What do they want? And how do we address those problems? Then how do we market to them from that point? How do we connect the customer to the product, basically? So that's that's kind of the path that I've chosen in life. What I what I want to do to begin our conversation, I have I have two hours. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I have two hours. Okay. And this is I'm going to ask a lot of questions. This is going to be an interactive type session. I am not really one for just lecturing for two hours. So please participate. Please uh, please uh, talk with me. Let's do this together. Uh, it's good to see that. Pretty much everybody is together. You have people next to you. That's good. How many of you would you say? Raise your hand if you are sitting next to someone that you think knows you pretty well. Okay, so that's that's maybe sixty sixty to seventy percent of you. Seventy percent of you are sitting next to a friend. Okay, this will become relevant as we uh, go along in the presentation here, because we're going to do some exercises together, and in some of these exercises. You and your friend might be surprised at the answers that you give each other. 
especially if you know each other. Okay. All right. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna blow your mind here right now. Did you know? Did you know that when you're using PowerPoint, if you want the screen to be black, you just hit the letter B and it makes the screen black. Then you hit it. That this is gonna revolutionize your life. I'm telling you. <laughs> and now I just hit the B button again. Boom. It's back on the screen. You don't have to put a piece of cardboard in front of the projector or anything like that. Just hit the B button. Okay. If you learn nothing else from me today, <laughs> you've now learned about the B button. Okay. So since this is a professional development type thing, I'm going to start with my personal background, not because I'm anything wonderful or special, but just so you know where I'm coming from and why I made the career decisions that I did. And then maybe, uh, maybe you can extrapolate that to your life, okay? So, and uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on this, but here we go. Okay, so I am hopefully using something that works. Okay, here we go. So I am from New Jersey. This little state right here that some people not from New Jersey call the armpit of America. Um, <laughs> Uh, right here down by the Philadelphia region. Anybody been to New Jersey before? Driven through New Jersey, maybe? Okay. Um, kind of right here by New York City. All right, that's where I grew up. Uh, I went to Brigham Young University in Utah for my undergraduate. Uh, I, decided, I decided when I got there, I had a really good high school physics teacher that got me into physics. So I started doing physics as an undergraduate there. I took a couple years off. Uh, I served a religious mission actually in Florida, and then I came back to BYU and I joined uh, in the physics department an AMO group, which most of you probably know stands for an Atomic Molecular Optical Physics Group, right? And in this group, we did a lot of really cool atom interferometry type experiments. We did some cold atom stuff. If you're familiar with with all that, you use a lot of lasers to cool atoms down, and then you measure fundamental constants of nature in these in these uh, these condensates. Turns out. I didn't really like atomic physics all that much, but I loved the optical physics part of it. I loved making the lasers and all that kind of stuff. So after, after working in this group for a number of years, graduated, and then was applying to grad schools, decided on the Institute of Optics in Rochester, New York. Um, there are a few big optics programs in the United States. There's this, there's the uh, University of Arizona has one, College of Optical Sciences, there's University of Central Florida. Those are kind of the big three. And so I decided to go to the Institute of Optics here and, and, uh, study, and study there. Anybody here have any idea what maybe this is a, de a design of? What's that? An objective lens, yeah. Yeah, a microscope lens. Those are pretty complicated little devices, huh? I thought maybe this crowd would, would know that. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, so I was there. And I was thinking, what kind of optics do I want to do? Um, I'd always, always been interested in the biological side of it. One of the reasons I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. This is like all bio, biomedical optics here. Uh, what I did was I sent out an email to the entire um, hospital, the, higher, the entire medical school, saying, does anybody want an optics guy to, to work in your lab for you? A couple people responded, one of which was uh, this lady right here, Dr. Micah Nadergaard. Nobody in the world of optics knows who she is. She doesn't actually know anything about optics. She is a world-renowned research in glial cells, which is a supporting cell in the brain. Uh, and her work was primarily in uh, looking at strokes and traumatic brain injury and then the role that glial cells play in that because they were thought to be just structural cells in the brain not really any, any kind of role other than to support the neurons. Turns out they're actually really important. They do a lot of stuff, and she's been a pioneer in that field in doing that. Anyway, so she reached out saying, hey, yeah, we could use an optics person because she's such a, a god in the field. She's very well funded. And so you can, you can see like this, this second floor here, this entire second floor of the medical center is her lab. Unbelievably big. Okay, so she says, I want to image better. And I say, what does that mean, right? That, that could be spatial resolution, that could be temporal resolution, that could be different kinds of things we're looking at. That is a very broad thing to say, I want to image better. 
So we talked about this for a while, and we, we came to the conclusion that what we were going to do is we were going to image faster. So what I did was I built, uh, I built two photon microscopes. This is what our, the lab primarily did for in vivo imaging was two photon microscopy. I built two photon microscopes for in vivo imaging of, of uh, the mammalian brain, primarily in mice and rats, rodents. Uh, and so we were looking at blood flow. I was particularly looking at blood flow. We fundamentally don't understand how blood flow works in the brain. Let's say I squeeze my hand. There is an area of the cortex that's responsible for squeezing my hand. So blood has to go from one area of the brain to the area of the brain responsible for my hand. And how does that happen? We fundamentally don't know that, right? And so that's what we were looking at here. And we can, we can talk about all that more in depth later if you'd like, but that's just a little background of what I did with her. Other responsibilities in the lab, like any of you working in labs know, you got your primary responsibility and then you kind of do a bunch of other things too. So, so maintaining the microscopes as the only optics person in this biological lab. Again, she didn't know anything about optics, neither did any other people in the lab. They were all neurosurgeons and biologists. So for me, it was kind of cool to be the optics guy in the lab. So I was responsible for maintaining all the microscopes. Um, and to give you an idea of the scale of the lab, you know, a lot of labs, when you think of two photon microscopy, you'll have three or four labs sharing a two photon microscope, right? You'll have a two photon microscope core that a bunch of people share. We had four two photon microscopes for our lab. Ridiculous, uh, but really cool. Okay, so that, that was that. A little more now on the personal side of things, I'm married. I was married as an undergrad, so I got started pretty young. So before I even went to grad school, I was married. This is my wife. This is us in Chicago a few months ago, back in June. Uh, I have four children. This picture is a little bit old, but I love it because it's totally their personalities. Um, and again, started with them pretty young as well. So by the time I graduated undergrad, I had one child. When I graduated grad school, I had three children, <laughs> at almost four, because, um, and we, we'll talk about work-life balance a little bit, maybe later if you'd like. But um, so they say, they say that the biggest, most stressful things that ever happen in someone's life is having a child, buying a house, starting a new job, right? They say these are all the big stress makers in your life. So when I was finishing my PhD, I, I started my job, I had my fourth child, I bought a house all within a month. Um, and the job that I took had me traveling a lot. So I was gone, my wife was home with four kids. Um, <laughs> and I was, I was still writing my dissertation from six to eight every morning, I was writing my dissertation and then I was working from eight until whenever in my real job. Um, trying to hold everything together, trying to move everything into the house. Fun times. Okay, so that's a little bit of background on me. Okay, I also, I'm going to share a little bit of background on Toptica. This is not an advertisement for Toptica. Let me please be very straightforward. This is not the intent. It's just so you know my background, the kind of company that was interesting to me. Let me ask this first. Oh, look at this, B button. Hey. Um, so how many of you think you want to go into a career in academia? How many of you think you want to go into a career in industry? How many of you just aren't quite sure? Okay. It's okay to be honest. That's why we're here. Okay. I knew from a very early, early stage in my academic career that I wanted to go into industry. Um, just, it's a different game. Everybody likes to play different games. I think of life as a big game, right? Um, and the, the challenges that you face in each game are different, and the industry game was just more interesting to me than the academic game. So, any, so, so looking at companies, Topic of Photonics, any company can either be, if it's gonna be successful, it usually fits into one of two categories. Either you're the, the lowest cost provider of something, or you're the highest tech provider of something, right? So this laser company, Toptica, we are the high tech provider. I'm not going to go into the whole product portfolio, but you, these, these are all the different. We've got fiber lasers, we've got CW lasers, pulse lasers, um, free space lasers, we've got all that kind of stuff. 
the size of our company. So we are a medium-sized company, and company size matters if you're going to go into industry, understanding the difference between a small, medium, and large company. We are a medium-sized company, about 300 people worldwide now, about 50 to 60 million euro in turnover every year. Um, lots of different technologies. Uh, one of the cool things about having lots of different technologies is that we serve lots of markets, and wow, you cannot see that at all. But there are a lot of different technologies and markets associated in there. Um, one of the downsides of having a lot of technologies is that it becomes hard to be known for any one thing, right? So you, you're kind of scattered among 30 markets rather than really killing one market. So there's, there's advantages to both. Uh, all the red firsts that you see in there, they simply indicate that we were the first to market with a certain technology. So I'm, I'm pushing this theme of technology pushing is what I'm pushing. It's kind of company culture. Company culture is something important to learn about if you're thinking about going to a company. I only put the revenue slide up here because we were talking about the breadth of, of technologies that we have. That is one of the advantages of having a lot of technologies is that when, let's say, the telecom bubble comes and goes, if you're, if you're in a lot of different product spaces, then any of those bubbles and bursts don't really affect you that much. Worldwide presence, so you can always find someone to, to deal with anybody anywhere. Um, this is like a 12, well, 18 month development cycle here, products that come out. Everything's gonna be high quality, there's company structure you don't need to know about. A lot, of, a lot of industrial partners and a lot of Nobel laureates love us. Um, this is like our pride slide. So all the ones with red dots, they're uh, customers of ours and these are all Nobel Prize winners over the past 15 years or so. Okay, so that's a little bit of intro on me personally and the kind of company that was interesting to me. I've worked for Toptica for about uh, coming up on six years now. Uh, I went with them straight out of grad school, like I said before. Any questions about like me as a person and, and who I am? Okay, so as far as what we're gonna do going forward here, so I just, I just started with my background. I wanna do a, couple, a few exercises with you, really is what I wanna do. A few exercises to kind of do some discovery of ourselves. Um, I feel like we talk a lot through our academic careers about academia. We talk a lot about research and we talk about how to be better researchers and we talk a lot about uh, collaborating with researchers and that is all awesome, it's totally great. But sometimes we get in this mode where we, we get tunnel vision and we are looking at our research and we're so focused on what we're doing that we don't take the time to just take a few minutes and look up and say, where am I actually going with all this? What am I gonna be doing in a few years? Is this work really getting me there? Or how do I take the work that I'm doing and actually get to where I wanna be in a few years? And so I wanna explore more of that side of it with you here. You might love it, you might hate it. I hope you love it. You're not the first group that I've done this with, so. Uh, yes. Okay. All right, one of the first things, let's do this. So first, a big thank you to OSA for uh, being such a big sponsor of this and for allowing me to come here. Thank you to the conference organizers who have done an incredible job. This is not an easy feat to bring so many people together like this and to organize this conference. So thank you to all of you for that. Uh, okay. One thing to, to remember as you're, as you're kind of transitioning from this part of your life and the next part of your life is that the skills that you're learning here don't necessarily don't, don't think that you're so pigeonholed. That's an expression that we use in the United States, at least. So don't think you're so, don't think that what you've done restricts you to only what you've done right now. The skills that you're developing now have a wide applicability into many other, many other industries, many other applications, okay? How many of you feel like you're more biomedical than you are optical? Okay. How many of you feel like you're more optical than you are biomedical? How many of you are not quite sure where you fall in there? Okay, that's good, okay. 
All right, a lot of biomedical. Okay, so then from an optics standpoint, let me show you this. I bet a lot of you know a lot more optics than you think you do. Uh, I have a few slides here that go through all the different kinds of all the different kinds of optics that are out there and, and things to think about. But let me let me just focus on this one. This is a really cool example of optics and how prevalent optics is in the world. You take your smartphone out, and when people when someone asks what is optics, I like to take my phone out because there's there's so much here. You, you look at the uh, the cameras, right? The cameras, the lenses in the camera, the sensor in the camera, the the flash, all of that, the sensing. That's all optics. The lithography, the microlithography, making the chips. That's all optics. The glass. That's all optics. The actual display itself is optics. Uh, the manufacturing of the of the display in there is optics. There's so many different technologies in there. Uh, we don't need to go into all these. You know what barcodes are. You know what fibers are. You know, every communication you do, every phone call you make goes through a fiber optic at some point. That's all optics. Uh, your video game systems, virtual reality, augmented reality, it's all optics. Drones, uh, quantum optics is becoming huge right now. Uh, LiDAR, you guys have heard of LiDAR? Yeah, no, maybe. No, a little bit. Okay, so self-driving cars, <laughs> this is the technology of a, this is the main driving technology behind, behind self-driving cars right now, is LiDAR which is a laser-based technology, so that's optic. Okay. All right, this is, let's do this. This will be our first exercise of the day. Uh, I, do you have a piece of paper? Do most of you have paper? A lot of you? Are you next to a friend that has paper? Okay. All right, we're going to do a few, a few exercises here that require writing something down. So now would be a good time to find a piece of paper. Okay. Okay, you ready? Got a piece of paper? Okay. We're going to go through a few exercises here. The first one is going to be, we'll call the first one, uh, who are you like? And then uh, the second exercise we'll call, uh, what are you really like? And, and we'll go from there. Okay. So this one, so I've got uh, the, next, the next 10 slides are going to be slides of different people that I know that have different, different careers within, within uh, optics, okay? And what I want you to do is, as, as I'm going through their biographies, it'll be pretty quick. We're not going to spend like two hours on this. Um, as I go through their biographies, I want you to think, which of these 10 people do you see yourselves most like in your career, okay? Make sense? You got it? There's a lot of chatter. You understand the rules? Got it? Okay. So first, all right, this first one's awesome. Hey, look, it's me. Okay. Okay, so like I, like I said before, I'm product manager. I, I actually have had a few roles at Toptica. I, I was in uh, sales for a while. I was in uh, applications for a while. Now I'm product management, right? Kind of want to do a little bit of everything. I just want to know how to do everything in the company with the goal eventually to be leaving the company potentially or another company, something like that. Uh, this is Dr. Patrick Leishing. He's uh, our director of R&D, okay? So as a director of R&D, you are managing people's schedules, you're managing the research schedules, you're managing timelines and resources for R&D, making sure that you're hitting targets on budget. That's what an R&D manager does. Uh, he, he has a PhD, he's at Siemens, he's been at a bunch of large companies before, he's with us now. Okay. This is Jennifer Parati. She's one of our manufacturing technicians. So she spends most of her time, well pretty much all of her time, assembling optical isolators. That's an optical subcomponent. So she's the key member of our team that goes and builds these systems all day, every day. She's not really doing R&D, but she's building them and testing them. 
uh, Dr. Willem Kenders. He's uh, one of the co-founders of the company. So he was, uh, he was uh, after he did his PhD, he realized that there, were, there was a need for, for these uh, very, very narrow band lasers. Uh, uh, and so he and, uh, and a friend, they started up the company pretty much right out of school, started up a company and, uh, and built it up to what it is today. Uh, Larry Shi, he's a salesperson, uh, but a very highly technical salesperson. Has an MBA, has a po uh, did a postdoc, has a PhD, uh, very well educated, so you can talk in an educated way with very sophisticated customers. Davy Foot, I gotta get a better picture of him up there. That's his LinkedIn picture. He plays the guitar, apparently. Um, he is uh, he's our main laser research scientist. So we develop lasers, of course. He's responsible for, for doing R&D on them and engineering them. So we come up with the specs. Maybe, maybe uh, I'll talk with customers. And I, the product management side, will come up with the specs. He will actually make the specs a reality, build the systems up to the customer spec. Jason Eichenholz, interesting guy. So he's, um, he's a technology development guy. Really what that means is he finds interesting technologies that need funding and need someone to develop them and pairs them with companies that are looking for interesting technologies. So he's kind of the, the bridge between technologies and companies. And so he's been um, recently, he's been one of the guys on the forefront of helping develop this LiDAR technology for, for automated vehicles. Alexis Voigt, she's awesome. So she, uh, she has a PhD as well. She started an industry in, uh, in Mel's Grio. You know that company, Bausch & Lomb, you probably know them as well. Uh, did very well there, but her passion was always in teaching. Her passion was always in academia. So she started an industry and then went back into academia. She's actually running the uh, optics program at Monroe Community College, which is near us there in Rochester. Uh, developing uh, developing programs for kind of that middle education workforce. It's not like PhD level, it's not master's level, but it's people that are going to go out and then be manufacturing technicians and stuff like that. So she started an industry and then went back into academia. Chun Li Guo, he is your hardcore research academic guy. Uh, publishes papers like crazy, gets all sorts of great recognitions for everything he does. He makes these uh, super black and hydrophobic materials uh, using using ultra short laser techniques. Uh, so he is your he is your typical academic professor with awesome research. Jennifer Barton, University of Arizona. She uh, she is also a research professor there. But she, uh, in addition to doing the research, she does research mostly on OCT and and some biomedical applications. She also run a, uh, runs the Bio Five program. So she's in academic administration as well. So kind of both worlds, the administration and in the research. Okay, so that's 10. So who do you see yourself most like out of those 10? And why? I'm gonna call on you. So who's, who's willing to share who they see themselves most like? This is the crowd participation part of the uh, of the of the meeting here. Oh, did I, got a hand back there. All right, you got to talk loud now. Davy Foot. Okay, why? Uh, hi there. So I am a PhD student and uh -huh. I work in the experimental lab. Uh -huh. So my journey started with uh, building a microscope inside the lab. So first two years of my PhD, actually I was, I am doing an integrated PhD course that includes master plus PhD. So within two years and two and a half years of us, this course, I built a microscope inside the lab. So, uh, and then after that I did so I have been for now four and a half year. After that, I have published around eight papers, research papers. So authored and co-authored papers. 
But what I found was most interesting for me was the building this microscope. Mm -hmm. So I want to go to uh, industry because I, uh, I can apply whatever I have learned to realize uh, and uh, give some output as a product in the market. That's why I want to go to R&D. All right, very good. Thank you. How many Davy Foots do we have out there? We got the one. Nobody else? Okay. Oh, two? Okay. Who chose somebody else? How, how many uh, Chun Li Guos do we have out here? One, two. Okay. Hardcore research guys. Okay. Who else? Well, like, that's only like five of you. Who else is popular? Ah, oh, Jennifer Barton. Yes. The academic and the administration. How many Jennifer Bartons do we have? Oh, there we go. All right. All right. Cool. Nobody over here is raising their hand for anything. Hmm. Okay. Uh, who, who else? Who else was there? Uh, how many Dan Christensen's do we have out there? <laughs> Nobody wants to raise their hand. <laughs> Four. Okay. Cool. All right, cool. Um, is, there, is there a role that you see yourself as that was not up here, that you were hoping to see up here? Always interested if I'm missing something up there. Okay, no? Okay. Okay, so so that's kind, of, that's kind of setting the background for the next activity that we're going to do here. We all think we know the kind of person that we are, and we all think we know what we'd want to aspire to in our careers as we go forward. So let's dive a little bit deeper into that then. So we're going to think about what motivates us. And maybe when I say that, you say, well, that's, that's silly. I know what motivates me. I, I like to do the research. I like to get out. I, you know, I want to get my PhD and get out of here. And, and I don't know. I don't want to be in school anymore, so that's what motivates me. <laughs> yeah, nervous chuckles, okay. Okay, so in this activity now, what I want to do, I'm going to put, whoo, that's pretty small. Can you guys see that? The ones in the back, can you see that? You see it okay? All right, so here's what, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So there's, there's like 20 different kinds of motivation, okay? So this is, this, is a really, this is a really honest exercise with yourself, and it's surprisingly difficult to do, okay? So don't feel bad if it's hard, because it is hard to do. We look at these motivations, and you've got to think to yourself, am I motivated by money in my career going forward, for example? All right, so money. Money is not a bad thing. You need money to survive, okay? So are you motivated mostly by money? Are you motivated by wanting to work with cool technologies? Are you motivated to achieve a work-life balance? Uh, do you really like writing grants? Bless your heart if you really like writing <laughs> grants. That's one of those things I did not want to do, and that's why I went into industry. Uh, do, you, do you really want leadership opportunities in your career as you go forward? Uh, do you want to do interesting research? How important is that to you? How important to you is the culture of where you work, whether it's an academic lab or, uh, or a company? Do you want to interact with people? Is that important? Or would you rather just be left alone to do your thing? How important is it to you to make the world a better place? Or do you not really care? Is location of where you're working important? Do you want to be teaching? Do you want to have a sense of accomplishment? How much do you care about how great your colleagues are? Or how great your, your facilities, your building, or wherever it is that you are, your resources? Is it important to you that you're getting continuing education wherever you are? How about vacation time? Is that important? That kind of goes with work-life balance, huh? Uh, the company size. So comments on company size. How many of you have done internships with a, with a company already? Oh, that's good. There's like maybe 10 of you that have. Okay. Were they with large companies or smaller companies? 
Smaller, smaller company? Larger company? Okay, some large, some small. Okay. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, you want to have a great relationship with your boss? Is there something else that I'm missing in here? And you can write that down as well. So these are, these are all good things for the most part, right? There's like 20 good things. I would love to have all of them, right? I'd love to have a lot of money. I'd love to interact with great people. I'd love to have great colleagues and, and uh, continuing education. These are all great things. What I'm going to ask you to do, though, I'm going to ask you to make, I kind of made this up. I'm, I'm going to ask you to make a pyramid here, okay? And I'm going to ask you to pick your top five things. One, two, three, four, five. Take your top five and then rank those top five in order of importance to you. You can only choose five, okay? And rank them in order of importance to you. I'll give you, I'll give you a few minutes to do this. A lot of people struggle with this, so don't, don't feel bad if it's hard to choose. Is there anything really important to you that I don't have up here that you wish were up here? What, what is that? Oh, now you're embarrassed. What? I, I still didn't hear you. Oh, food? <laughs> Write that on your pyramid if you want. Who's got their top five? Okay, about a third of the way there. This is all really well done, by the way. The, the signs and the, the sponsors and everything. Good job, whoever put all that together. It's really well done. Hey, who's got their five? Okay, we're getting there. I'll give you another, another couple minutes. Okay, now this is the fun part. Remember how I asked in the beginning if you were sitting next to someone that you know? Uh-oh. What do you think I'm going to say? What is, what's the uh-oh? <laughs> uh, so if you, if you know the person sitting next to you, we're going to get together in groups here now of, of two or three people, okay? Uh, so turn to the person next to you. And if you know the person next to you, I want you to tell the person next to you, your good friend, what you think their top five are. Okay? And what's that? Yeah. If you think you know that person, try to get, to, based on your relationship with them, I, it's fun. It's fun to think. Wait, fun, to, fun to see what other people think your top five are. And then, okay, then after you do that, 
then actually share what your top five are with the person next to you, okay? And you got to, hey, but then there's one more, one more, hold on. But then you also got to explain why those are the top five to you, okay? All right, go for it. All right, two, two minutes, maybe one minute.
Okay, friends. All right, so did any of you guess the top five of the person sitting next to you? Really? That's amazing. Were you two a pair, the two of you each guessed? Are you like sisters or something? That's incredible. All right, awesome. Who, who guessed the top one, at least? Uh, we got a few, okay. A few, all right. How, how many of you were totally surprised by what the person next to you said they thought were your, were your top choices? There's a couple of hesitant hands going up. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, who's, who would like to share what their top five were? All right. Let's get the, let's get the microphone over here. We got two mic. We got microphones all over the place. This is awesome. Okay. Start. So uh, we'll start. We'll start with him. Yep. We're good. So it goes from most important to least important. Say so what's that? It goes from most important to least important. Yeah, most important to least important. Technology. Okay. So you want to work with cool technology. Uh, interesting research. Interesting research. Oh, interesting research. Okay. Money. Yeah. Okay. Uh, leadership opportunities. All right. And vacation time. And what? Vacation time. Oh, vacation time. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Good. There's a lot of people that disagree with your uh, vacation time, apparently. <laughs> does, it, does that mean that he works really hard? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, that's a compliment in like kind of a backhanded way. Okay. All right, who else? Okay. Hello. Uh, What's my your first name? Priority is, uh, my name is Abhishek Pathar. I'm an IT Warangal. All right. Yeah. My first priority is technology. Hey, another technology, okay. <laughs> and second is money. All right. Third is work-life balance. Work-life balance, yeah. Uh, fourth is great colleague. And fifth is teaching. Fifth is what? Teaching. Oh, teaching. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Right here in the middle black shirt. Oh, we have one down here already. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. All right, start with your name. Uh, my name is Himadri Tanaya. I'm okay. from TFR. So right. uh, my most to list uh, goes like this. Uh, sense of accomplishment All right. is on the top. Uh, interesting research, leadership opportunities, interacting with people, and money. All right. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, my name is Ishan, and my Ishan. list goes like: uh, first priority is leadership opportunities. Uh huh. Second is sense of accomplishment. All right. Uh, third is obviously money. Uh, obviously. Uh, <laughs> fourth is work-life balance, and fifth is vacation. All right. Okay, how many of you, how many of you have uh, work-life balance as your number one? That's usually a pretty popular one. About half of you, work-life balance is number one. How many of you have uh, technology as number one? How about interesting research as number one? Yeah. Okay, how about, uh, how about money as number one? All right. <laughs> I'm going to collect all your names and uh, interview you for sales positions uh, before the end of this weekend. <laughs> okay, so why, why do we go through this process right here? Why did I want to do this with you? It's fun to do, but why would I want to do this with you? Okay, so the first thing we did was we went through a bunch of different people, right? I said, which of these people do you see yourselves most like? This exercise, I think, is a little bit more of the honest exercise, is what kind of people we really are. Um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I've seen many times. This is an industry, but it's applicable to academia. It's anywhere else. We get this vision of what we think we want to do, what we want to be in life or what we think seems good. But then when it comes down to us, down to it, our, our motivations, the things that actually make us happy or bring us happiness aren't necessarily in line with what we thought we wanted to do with our lives. I'll give you an example. We had 
we've had uh, people come in on the sales, for example, because they they thought it'd be you know fun to make money or fun to work with. I'm really putting emphasis on the money part of sales, aren't I? I don't mean to do that. It's, it's, in in sales, especially in technical sales, which is what we do, you're really developing relationships with really smart people. Is what you're doing, and you're enabling them in their research. So that's a really cool part of highly technical sales. Is feeling like you're enabling these groups to do cool research. Um, and so we've had multiple people come into sales roles that thought that, that just for whatever reason thought that they'd be making a lot of money and meeting a lot of cool people and that's what they wanted. But then they leave after like six months and go to research, go to R&D, because it turns out, well, you know, maybe that seemed like cool. It seemed cool to travel and it seemed cool to, 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 to be in sales. What, they re what really motivates them is R&D work, is working with cool technology, doing hands-on type stuff. And so the early on, or the earlier on that you can really figure out what gets you out of bed in the morning, what motivates you, the faster you're going to find a career that, that makes you happy in life. The whole purpose of this presentation I'm doing with you today is not how to find a job, per se, because you guys are all really smart, okay? Finding a job, I would wager, is not going to be difficult for anybody in this room. It's more about finding the right job for you. And so that's what, that's what we're focusing on right here, right now, is, is learning a little bit more about ourselves. It sounds kind of hokey, doesn't it? We're going to learn about ourselves and <laughs> find the right careers. But like, that's actually kind of a pretty important thing. You don't want to spend a lot of your time doing something that doesn't make you happy. You don't spend years of your life doing something that doesn't make you happy. Find, you know, learn about yourself. Take that time to really investigate what makes you happy. Um, for me, if I were to take my top five, I should have been doing that while I was watching you guys giggle. Uh, if I were to take my top five, the top five would probably be, uh, you know, money's important to me, uh, work-life balance, leadership opportunities, continuing education, and maybe a sense of accomplishment. And so when you look at your pyramid, you look at the top five things that are important to you, that should tell you something. Uh, maybe that's too strong. But it should, it should indicate something to you about where in your career would be a good place to go. So if we look at this pyramid, let's say, wait, did I have uh, the bottom as the biggest one or the most important I have on the bottom? Okay. So let's say this is what your pyramid looks like. Let's say money is most important and then technology and then working with cool people, doing something challenging and, and the culture of where you are. This to me would indicate probably you want to be in some sort of industrial role, maybe, maybe in sales or in, uh, something that. Uh, or maybe a CEO or you know, executive in a company, something like that, working with a high-tech company. If your pyramid looks something like this, where you know, really interesting research, challenging work, working with technology, cool people, writing grants, that's a game a lot of people like to play, you know, competing for grants. Then this is, is probably more of an academic-type pyramid, right? So when, you, when you've made this list without knowing what the purpose of it is, now going back and looking at it, Maybe that gives you a little more insight into yourself for what's the best for you in your career. Okay, good. All right, we've been going about an hour. Everybody's still awake? Okay. All right, everybody's going to stand up. Going to stand up for a second. All right. And I want you to lightly tap the shoulder of the person next to you. Okay, good. Now, okay, you can all be seated. And you can, all, you can all now say that you've been uplifted and touched by this presentation. <laughs> you liked that one, didn't you? Yeah, you did. <laughs> okay. Let's do this. Hold on a second here. I, if I go through this, gosh, uh, let's do this. I'm going to, 
I'm going to quit this presentation for a second. I want to get into some more real world applicable type advice, if we can do that for maybe the next I don't know, 20 minutes. So let's talk about let's talk about resumes and CVs. Who thinks they have an Nobody's going to raise their hand for that one. Oh, we got one. OK, she does. All right, good for you. OK. You might. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Um, what is the purpose of a resume or a CV? Mumble, mumble, mumble. I can't hear what any of you are saying. If you're, let's say you're going into industry. You're making a resume for, for a job in industry. What is the purpose of that resume? Why are you making it? To show your appropriateness for that particular role. OK, that is a good answer. Show that you can bring value to the company. That's, that's also true. But the end goal, what I'm looking, I'm fishing here. What I'm looking to show experience, yes, that's all true. What I'm looking for is the purpose of a resume is not to get you a job. The purpose of a resume, the only purpose of the resume, is to get you the interview. OK? <laughs> so there's got to be enough on there. This is the most concise way I can think of to say how much to put on a resume. There's got to be enough on there that no responsible hiring manager can put that down without saying, I have to talk to this person some more. All right? So when you're making a resume, that should be your goal. You, you, don't want to, you don't need to say everything you've ever done in your entire life on there. It needs to be structured in such a way that it conveys what that person is expecting to see. Let's, let, me, let me do this with you. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of resumes with you. And I want you to tell me what you like about them, and what you think could be improved. And I have intentionally, uh oh, what did I do? This is not my computer. How do I get this up on the screen now? Oh, I broke it. OK, there we go. OK, cool. <laughs> All right. Let me zoom into this. Dude, you are not going to be able to read this in the back. Let's see. Can we zoom into this? Man, what's your name? Akash. Akash? This guy knows everything. All right. <laughs> Wait, what, what was the trick? What did you push? Oh, control. I was doing shift plus. Okay, control plus. <laughs> control. Uh, whoa, that's too much. Okay. All right. So I'm going to scroll through this. And you, you just take some mental notes here. What do you like about it? And what do you think could be improved on it? Okay. So here we go. I intentionally took names out of it. This is for a project manager type of role. I should have said what the role was this person was applying for. Okay, we're not going to read through all the articles. Conference proceedings, proceedings, bio data. Okay. So, what do you like about it? What would you like to see improved about it? 
Now, this is, I, I get really interested hearing your feedback on this. I, I looked through so many resumes. So, what do you think? Oh, it's too long? Someone says it's too long? Okay. What else? I'm not going to say whether I agree or disagree with you at this point. Okay, too long? Huh? Contain, contains? It contains too much. Too much information. Okay. The, the presentation's not appropriate? Okay, how would you change the presentation of it? Okay, some more bullet points emphasizing certain certain key aspects. Okay. Instead instead of paragraphs. Okay. Uh, this was for a project manager role, yes. Ah. You understand the difference between a product manager and a project manager. It's good. Okay. A lot of people don't when they're students. Okay. Any other, any other comments on this? Okay, so I'll, I'll take you through some of my comments on this, iterating what was said before. So the very first thing I would say is in line with, sorry, I forget your name, but what, what, uh, what you said, um, there's way too much to read in this resume. Um, you want to make it easy. You want to make it super easy for whoever is looking at your resume to know who you are within somewhere between three and 10 seconds. As you just don't get a lot of time with people looking at your resumes. It's a, it's a very rare situation that someone's going to take your resume and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set apart five minutes to look at this person's resume, and, you know, kick back and look in and like read it like it's a scientific paper. That's just not going to happen for the most part. So very clearly, right off, right away, they have to be able to look at it and know know something about you. I look at this, and this it makes it difficult for me to extract who this person is from all of these words. Someone said too long. I would agree with that for this role in industry. Now, if you're, if you're applying to be a professor somewhere or doing a postdoc, of course, you want to have all of your publications. You want to have everything in there for those kinds of positions. Maybe even for some R&D positions in industry where you're expected to publish, uh, you want to have all of that in there. But think about it from the employer side. Everything that you put in your resume says something about you. Your resume tells a story about you. So, for example, when I'm looking through a resume, when I, when I see publications, that tells me two things. It tells me that the person can organize thoughts in a logical way, and it tells me that they can communicate, which is really important to me. So I don't need to see all the publications. Uh, for most industry roles, two pages. One, one page front and back is really kind of the, the max length that you want to have. And if you have a lot of publications, that's awesome. I would suggest that you, you put in there maybe one or two of your most important publications to you, and then a line that says, you know, 36 publications, 12 first author, 24, you know, supporting author, available upon request, something like that. So at least you give all that information, but you don't have them all listed out. That'll help you save some space. Um, when I see volunteer and community activities that tells me that you that there's more to you than just work, right? I like to see some of that stuff. It tells you that it tells me that you have leadership potential if you've been involved in chapter leadership or something like that, for example. If you've uh, if you've helped a, if you've made an ions conference or something like that. It says a lot about, you know, who you are as a person. I'm trying to I'm trying to get a narrative of who this person is as I scan their their resume. There's a lot of things that I just expect, and I'll go into this a little bit more later. Um, okay, so I think, I think we've beat this resume. Let's look at another one. Oh, no. How do we get out of this full page mode? Come back. <laughs> I hit escape. Why did it work for you? Oh, don't leave. I might need you again still. Man, 
It's embarrassing. PhD in physics and I can't operate a computer. Jeez. All right, why don't you just do it? You, you make that. Oh, you know what? They can, they can read it as it is. This is fine. We can do it. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Resume number two. What do we like? What do we want to see different? of awards. Okay. Bunch of presentations. Posters. Bunch of publications. Okay. More publications. Reports. IP. My resume is not this extensive. This was for a, a laser engineer. Okay, so what did what did we like about it? What do we think could be improved? Oh, you like the organization much more over this one. Okay, me too. All right. Hmm. Yeah, he, he could compact it down and still be just as effective. Yeah. 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 Is the back row falling asleep or do you just need to see the screen better? Okay. All, right. All the lights go off in the room. All right. Any other comments on this one? Okay. Let me. I agree. I completely agree. The, uh, the format of this one is light years ahead of the first one we looked at. Let me focus a little bit more on content with this one though. So let's look at let's look at this summary. I actually really like having a summary section somewhere on the first page, on the top half of the first page. This is my preference, Woo. me personally. I like having a summary section in there. But let's look at the word choices that, that, that's used here. 11 years of ultra-fast laser experience, inventor of new technologies. Experience in plasmonics, photonics, laser processing, nonlinear optics, okay. Proficient in a wide array of imaging techniques and software. Excellent in troubleshooting, um, experiencing leading teams, all right, and then some languages. What do you think of that? What do you think of that part right there? I can't hear you. I'm hearing some people saying it's good, some people saying, I don't know. But that's a very good point. Words and phrases like this have a high impact when they're coming from someone else. You could be saying anything about yourself. I could, I could read someone's, when I read this, he might as well be saying, I'm a wonderful person, I'm a hard worker, I'm self-motivated. Anybody can say that, and I have no idea if it's actually true, right? Those kinds of things, I can infer by reading the rest of it. If, they, if this person has, you know, 100 publications in four years, I say, oh, this person's probably a pretty hard worker, right? If uh, it says, I develop new technology. If I look at what you did in your project and see that you developed a new microscope, I think to myself, oh yeah, this person developed new technology. You don't have to tell me that. I'm gonna infer that if you've done your, your resume correctly, and it's better that I've learned that from your resume than if you tell me directly. What was frustrating to me about this one, actually, and the notes that I made about this resume when I read it, 
was after reading his entire resume, I still had no idea what this person could actually do. Okay? And this is a trap we all fall into because we, we, we tend to get generic, but you want to be specific. Okay? So what does 11 years of ultra-fast laser experience mean? I have interviewed people that say that they have years of ultra-fast laser experience, and that means that they have built an ultra-fast laser from the ground up. They've done the, the cavity design in, you know, in modeling software. They've ordered the parts. They've, they've, they've modeled it in CAD and everything, and they've done it. I've had people use that exact same phrase to say that they built a two-photon microscope with an ultra-fast laser that they bought from uh, Coherent or Spectrophysics or something like that. Completely different skill sets. And I have no idea from this what this person can actually do with a laser. They're applying to be a laser engineer, and after reading the resume, I have no idea if they know how to build a laser or if they know anything about a laser. Almost every sentence in this paragraph here can be interpreted many different ways. And so the specificity of it was something that really needed to be improved in this one. Okay, let's look at one more example. So you did view full screen mode, and then I'm learning. OK. This will be our third and last resume that we look at right here. This was, this is also, uh, this was like a laser engineer or a technical field service engineer. I was looking for one of those two positions. Okay, that's it. What do we think about this one? It's good. <laughs> it's probably true. Probably was just trying to increase the number of points there. Strong problem solving skills, excellent communication. Okay, fair points. What else? Anything we like about it? Anything we dislike about it? It's really well organized. Yeah, that's true. Really wanted to emphasize that, I guess. <laughs> okay. So I'll tell you this. Anytime there's a, okay, this is uh, maybe more for industry. Anytime there's a job posting put up somewhere, it's because there is a specific need in an organization that needs to be filled. There's a very certain, a very specific skill set that a team is trying to fill, usually is how this works, right? And so when, when I wrote the job description for this, I say, well, here's, and here's a little secret. I'm going to say in there that I want someone that can do MATLAB, Mathematica, you know, all the different programs. I want someone that can program in C++ and Java and, and Visual and all that. I want someone that can do LabVIEW and MATLAB. I want someone that can do Python and uh, Ruby, right? I want someone that has uh, six years of experience in laser development and five years of experience in leadership. Pretty much this person doesn't exist, right? I'm just putting everything in there that I want, but there are a few key things in there that I really want. I really want the, the CAD design ability, and I really want the the modeling design ability, the, the mathematical, you know, the MATLAB. And we, we do a lot of stuff in LabVIEW in the company. We do a lot of stuff in, in Python. So I really want those things. 
So I've specifically listed all of these things. What you want to do is you want to make it very clear to whoever's looking at your resume that you have those skills, okay? And that's what I loved about this one right here. Right off the bat, the very first thing he does, it says, well, these are the skills you're looking for, and I have them. I can do Python, I can do Mathematica, I can do all the Word stuff. Um, I can, I'm very comfortable with complex optical setups. Um, I can do nonlinear optical characterization and time resolve techniques. You know, all the things that we were looking for, he very, he, without lying, never, ever, ever lie. It never works out well for you. But make sure you emphasize what you can do and how proficient you are at it, okay? He put that all right on there, right on the very front, front page, top section. I took this resume within, literally, within five, seven seconds. How long did it take for, for you to catch those bullet points there? Maybe seven, ten seconds to catch that? Within ten seconds, I already knew that I had to call this person. From that point on, after, after I knew that they had the basic requirements of what I was looking for, at that point forward, I'm just checking off boxes in my mind of things that, at this point, I would expect to see there. So once I read through those skills, at this point, I just expect for them to be a PhD or a master's student. I expect for them to have you know, some publications. I expect for them to have you know, some volunteer activity, something like that. And so at that point, I'm just quickly going down and go, okay, good, they got a PhD. Okay, yeah, they did projects. Of course, they did projects. It's relevant to what we're doing. Great. Uh, yeah, they've got some, some professional experience. Cool. Awards, publications. Awesome. I've spent maybe a minute on this, maybe two minutes, and I've got a great candidate now to go forward with. This person now works for us. And he's awesome. Great hire. Okay. Any, any questions for me on resumes? Anything that we've, any other questions that you have that I haven't addressed? I am happy to, if you would like, um, later today or tomorrow or Monday, I'll, I'll, I'll be here through Monday. If you want me to look over your resume with you, I mean, there's a lot of you, so I probably can't do all of you. But if you want me to look over your resume with you, I'm happy to do that, uh, spend a few minutes with you, and we'll just go through it and I'll tell you why you're awesome, and I'll tell you why the resume doesn't convey why you're awesome. Or I'll tell you the resume is awesome. Okay, escape button work this time. Okay. All right, how about this for a fun activity? How about the interview? Let's say you are, let's say you're, you're this guy, and you've gotten the phone call. And we had a great phone call. Uh, and I'm going to bring you in for an in-person interview. Who wants to do an interview with me? Come on. Let's pull. Let's give me a chair. Let's pull some chairs up. Can we take this chair, too? All right. Oh, come on. It's just you and me and a and hundred of your favorite friends over here. All right, you? Okay. We'll do, we'll do two of you. Okay, we'll do you first, and then we'll do you. We'll go quick. You get the advantage of going second. I'm going to turn this mic off so we don't have feedback. Is this on? Yeah? Yours is on? Um, yeah, it seems. Yeah, it's All on. Right. It's like we're going to have a American Idol thing up here together. <laughs> OK. Is there an Indian Idol? Is there? Yeah, it's all over the place, isn't it? Do you have your own version of Simon Cowell, the guy who's like always angry at everybody? <laughs> no? OK. All right, have a seat. Thank you. All right, what's your name again? Uh, Tyagarajan. Tyagarajan. It's going to be difficult. Tyagaraj? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so bad. No, it's fine. Everybody Tyagaraj. has a problem with that. Tyagaraj. Yeah. Close it, enough. Yeah, it's here. Okay. 
Good to meet you. Thanks for coming in today. Okay, so we're going to interview for, what should we interview for? Let's do a, a laser engineer. Does that work for you? Yeah, I can. I can try. You can try? Okay. Well, actually, make this a little more real. So what is your, what is your actual research? What do you do? Um, I'm a BSc student. Um, I'm a BSc student. Oh, you're a bachelor student. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do you, what do you, what do you, uh, what are you interested in? I'm interested in neuroscience. You're interested in neuroscience. You've taken some neuroscience classes, I, I imagine. Uh, yeah. Okay. What year are you? Um, third year. Third year. Okay. So you, next year you're going to be finishing up. No, I'm. We'll be finishing it this year. Oh, you'll be finishing this year. Okay. Nice. Cool. Uh, so this is good. This is a pretty real exercise here, then. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, and what do you what do you think you want to do with neuroscience? Um, I want to do my MSc in neuroscience. Um, I really like imaging techniques, so I want to do something new in that field. Yeah, which techniques? Imaging. Oh, imaging. Okay. Have you done some imaging in a lab already? Uh, no. You haven't. Okay. But I've read upon it. I've read a lot about it. Read but... a lot about it. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So we're going to be. Uh... I'm more familiar with American places than I am with Indian places. Uh, but there, there's a place in, uh, in the United States, the Allen Brain Institute. It's in, uh, it's up in Oregon um, or Washington, doesn't matter. Um, but they, they, they do a lot of research into the brain up there, a lot of imaging of the brain. So let's say you're, you're applying to be a, a research engineer at the Allen Brain Institute, okay? Uh, I'll be Dan, you can be you, okay? Okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll start the interview now. Okay. Hey, thanks for coming in today. It's, uh, it's, it's really great to have you here. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, I do have your resume. I've looked through it. Obviously we're impressed by it. We have you here. So with that said though, why don't you, why don't you take me through your resume and, and who you are? So, uh, my name is Tiago Rajan. Mm -hmm. I've finished my bachelor's degree in Manipal. Hopefully, I'll be finishing it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that would be an awkward start to the interview. <laughs> no, considering the present situation, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I've always had interest in neuroscience. Uh, I want. I always wanted to do something about it. Um, so I, I'm not really a person who interacts with a lot of people around. Uh, so I used to, I generally read work, read work. That's generally the procedure. I do interact with people, but not as familiar. Not, I don't go out with friends. I don't really do that much. But I'm really good with my colleagues. I have a good relationship with everyone around me. Um, so uh, I really like amazing techniques. I want to learn more about it. So generally, uh, in vivo, uh, imaging is something that I want I'm really interested in because in most cases, uh, people have to extract the tissue and then perform imaging, which obviously you're gonna have to kill, you know, animals. I'm really against it. <laughs> so in vivo imaging is kind of something I'm interested in. I've I've been learning about in vivo imaging a lot. So what what uh, what made you interested in in neuroscience to begin with? So I read uh, a paper, I don't remember the title now, but I read a paper which said that uh, in order, uh, uh, there was an image of brain mm -hmm. um, uh, sections. So uh, there were neurons and they had an image, histological image. So, and I'm really interested in physics as well. So I've seen images of the observable universe mm -hmm. and both of them seem very similar. Uh, uh, very familiar and I was thinking okay so the neurons look like the universe so I couldn't really study the entire universe I've got at best about 80 90 years so I'll at least study neurons <laughs> could be something you know similar they both look same I've seen the observable universe a picture yeah, yeah. So both, I can't study yeah, the universe I, I know see, that I see what you're saying yeah I hear you uh, so okay so you want to you want to study kind of music in neurology uh, how is that what you said? Music? No, imaging. Oh, imaging in neurology. Okay, but you don't want to. You don't want to. You don't want to hurt animals in the process. Yeah, that's why in vivo imaging. In what kind? In vivo of? imaging, where oh, you in don't. Vivo. Yeah. Okay. Um. So what what techniques are you aware of that would enable you to do this this kind of imaging? Well, uh. 
So we can we generally have uh, optogenetic form of imaging where mm. you use light to excite neurons and you would keep a track of how the neuron works mm -hmm. in and around. So you don't really have to. Uh, in that case, you don't really have to damage the model you're working on, rats, mice, whatever you're working on. Mm -hmm. So that is one of them. So there are not many in vivo imaging techniques as far as I know. Uh, so I've read upon it, but nothing's coming up right now. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm trying to do, as as we go through this and as uh, as I ask questions, I'm trying to learn more about what he what he has done. Now he's he's an undergrad. He hasn't been in a research lab yet. So I'm steering away from the questions that are like, tell me about your research and tell me about exactly what you did. I'm trying to learn more about, in this situation, I'm trying to learn more about what actually motivates him, right? The things that we talked about before, is I want to see, <clears throat> since he doesn't have a lot of research that I can look at, really what I'm looking at is how he's going to fit in the team culturally. And if I think he's going to actually like or enjoy the work that we have to do here. Now, probably if he's at the, the Allen Brain Institute, you're probably going to be hurting animals. Um, probably going to be doing a lot of experiments that require uh, that require uh, sacrificing mice and rats and those kinds of things. But maybe you'll be developing technologies or something like that. You'll be developing the in vivo technologies. So then I, I would I would find out more about his interest in that, if he wants to actually be doing the experiments or if he wants to be developing the technology, you know, those kinds of things. And so in, in the interview process, when you're interviewing with somebody, they're going to be asking you questions always with some specific reason in mind why they're asking you those questions. They're looking to see how you're going to contribute to the team, what exactly you did. So, well, thank you. That's good. Thank you. Were you an undergrad as well? PhD. PhD, okay. We'll get a mix. Thank you. And what was your name again? My name is Himadri. 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 Yes. Okay. Have a seat. Thank you. Okay. okay so, um, so what actually are your research interests again? Uh, so uh, I am into photonics. So to be specific, I'm uh, currently working on uh, localized uh, light in a plasmonic system. Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, right now the project is based on that topic. I work in TIFR Mumbai, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, I had I joined like six months ago, and uh, I have worked in two projects as of now. I have been engaged in two projects. So in six months. Yeah, in this six months. Okay. So basically, the first project that I was, that I was on, uh, uh, I had to go to the uh, some other lab in the institute that had a femtosecond laser in mm -hmm. order to work in that, but. Uh, due to certain uh, circumstances like humidity and also I had to stop the experiment for that reason for a time being. And then I'll be again going back again once the instrument is uh, uh, again, it has been refurbished and then I can go on to continue with the other project as well. Okay. Yes. Do you see yourself wanting to go more into academia or industry? Uh, well, more into academia. More into academia? Yes. Okay. And do you see yourself more as a developer of technology or more of a user of technology? I would say I'd lie kind of in between because I would like to go into developing of the technology, but I'm not so sure about the current knowledge that I'm having. Maybe sometimes in future, if I see something and something clicks in my brain and I might be able to develop some technology that might spark into it. And right now I feel like I'm in a learning curve of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do see myself as I could be a developer of technology. And well, I am a consumer of technology as of now, yes. Yes. Okay, so this was not the interview. This was me just sincerely getting to know you. Yeah, and okay. this was me sincerely answering <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, so let's let's actually start the interview. Okay. Okay. Again, great to have you here. Thank you for coming. Pleasure so is mine. I, you know, I, I, we we chatted briefly on the phone before. I, I know your resume, but again, just, just briefly tell me about about you and how you got to be where you are today. Okay, so uh, uh, since my childhood, I had been uh, very much interested in research because I kept uh, on asking myself, uh, pondering upon certain questions that were like, why, uh, like, I had this thing, like, may, why are we, uh, 
on the earth. Like I, I used to think we live inside the earth. But then I came to know that, no, we reside on the surface of the earth. And then I was like, how, how, how can we just be on the surface? Because the planet is round, then I could just fall off, right? Mm -hmm. And that is something that had like certain questions like that had, that had drove me to find answers. So that, that's how I got uh, indulged into research. And to tell you honestly, uh, uh, I used to be, uh, I used to think that I would go for this astronomy, astro, uh, astrophysics and all, because like everyone, I get fascinated uh, looking at planets and the solar system and everything, how these galaxies, black holes, and every kind of interesting uh, subjects that come up every uh, year mm -hmm. that we see. And uh, uh, my uh, getting into photonics was kind of, uh, you can say, an opportunity in disguise. I first got the opportunity as a winter project in Iser, Kolkata, where I went. And uh, that time, it was sheer for the fun of enjoying the place. That's it. I did not uh, supposed to actually learn something on it. But uh, then I did attend the lectures and everything. But to tell you frankly, I did not get any knowledge on that. Like, I didn't go there on the basis of getting knowledge. But since because I attended that conference that, that time, the next year, I got the opportunity to uh, get into a project at, at Nizer Bhuvneshwar uh, in a photonics lab, because I had a past experience of actually attending a winter school. And that is how that, that's how I grabbed that opportunity. I went for the project, and that inspired me, like the experiments I did. Uh, I had the experiment of uh, obtaining a hologram of the object, and that was fascinating. How we can actually, using light, we can create something like some virtual reality. And for a, I was an undergrad back then. So it was kind of sheer magic to me. And to understand the science behind it, it was terrific. And that's how I developed this love for photonics in that case. So very oftentimes, uh, I and many other people I know will start interviews with this very soft question of, so tell me about yourself or uh, tell me how you got to where you are today. And that's, that's a very general question. And what we're not looking for is for, for someone to say, well, my name is Dan and I'm from uh, New Jersey and I have uh, a sister and uh, parents <laughs> and um, I went to Lenape High School. You know, uh, I say, tell me about yourself. I'm <laughs> not looking for that, but looking for, I'm looking for the narrative of your life in the way you tell it and how you went to school, why you went to school, why you studied the, what you did, to try to get an idea of where your passions are. And as you notice, as she was going through her story, how her face kind of lit up as she was talking about kind of falling into optics by chance and how she really kind of was maybe even surprised and enjoying the things that she enjoyed. And, it, and that's what I'm looking for as an interviewer. I'm trying to pick up on what things are, are really important and really special to this person, why they made the life decisions that they did to go the way that they did. Because that will maybe indicate in the future as well what decisions they'll make too, what, what really brings them excitement in life. That's, that's pretty good. Okay, that's, that's a good narrative. Thank you. Okay. Um, so tell me, tell me about your research. Okay, so coming to my research, uh, uh, I'll tell you, uh, so there's this concept of Anderson localization. Which what was, is that? Yes, so I'll describe it to you. So Anderson localization is basically, uh, to explain in the most layman term, is like if you have, suppose you have this uh, uh, liquid with certain particles in it, and then you're putting light inside. This is lipids you said? Sorry? You said lipids? Liquid. Oh, liquid. liquids. Okay. Any liquid with some liquid scatterer, with in scatterer yeah. particle inside, mm -hmm. and then you're putting light into it. Right. Mm -hmm. So the light would like there would be a certain part of the light that would get diffused, they get scattered, that get reflected. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, if we keep on increasing the uh, concentration of the particles, what happens is uh, then there are certain processes that go in during the scattering of the light mm -hmm. within the uh, within the solution or the sample. What happens is basically they get scattered back. That you say is the coherent scattering, like coherent backscattering. Okay. So what happens is that the uh, certain uh, uh, certain the photons of the light uh, who have the same phases they in, uh, they again combine with recombine and that leads to localization of light within okay. so this is when we visualize a three dimension system but when we come to a one dimensional system if we see so if we have this array of potential 
and we are throwing light into it. Suppose there's a crystal, like uh, there's a photonic crystal, which has got a photon, uh, the, there's a periodic arrangement of atoms within. Mm -hmm. When you're pushing, when you're, uh, uh, when you're propagating light into the system, when you throw light into the system, the light propagates, right? Yep. The wave function, if you see it, so as it is encountering each atom, the some part of the wave function gets transmitted, some part of it gets reflected. As it goes on to the next, so basically what happens is, you, uh, it undergoes a diffusive profile. Okay, so mm -hmm. if there is a, per a periodic arrangement also. Now, if we add some disorderness into the system, basically what we are doing is like, we are uh, playing with the periodicity. If we are uh, uh, ch changing the interspace uh, atoms, with the spaces between these atoms randomly, mm -hmm. basically what happens, the, uh, the, the, the first thing that we are looking at into was our periodic potentials like a block system, like the block waves. But when you're adding disorderness, what happens is some of these uh, potential would come nearby and then far by and far by. So what happens is uh, instead of light propagating through the medium, it gets localized because of this variation in potentials. Mm -hmm. Okay, And this leads to what is known as localization or the Anderson localization. So what do you see? The feature that uh, indicates that there is a localization that has taken place is when you look at the wave function, in case of a periodic system, you would get a diffusive profile, which is symmetric and Gaussian. But when you have localization, what happens to the profile is like you get an exponential decay. So this exponential decay, uh, and uh, like it wouldn't be broad anymore, the width would decrease and it would have exponential decay in both ends. And this is when you realize that, okay, localization has taken place. And that is something that we are trying to study in the plasmonic system. These have already been studying in, uh, studied in electronics, uh, like in electrons and matter waves. And plasmonic system is quite a new uh, topic to like research into like what's going on in there and to get fascinated regarding what we are going to observe as results. Very nice. Yes. So when I when I ask the question, tell me about your research. Again, it's a very soft question. Um, I hope you would be able to answer that well, as as you do. Um, I am looking for a couple of things in this question. I hope that you know your research well, and so I'm I'm looking for how well you can teach. I want to see how well. Uh, I'm also. I'm also at that point, I would start asking questions, uh, narrowing down to see where the edges of the knowledge are, if I can, right? So I wanna see where, where the breadth of knowledge really goes. What then I would ask then is I would ask more specifics about the research methods. I would ask not just what was done, but what exactly you did. This is something that we, we find a lot of people do, is you, talk, you say the word we, we're very humble people oftentimes. We say, okay, so what was the research? Well, we, uh, we did whole brain imaging of mice after suffering traumatic brain imaging or uh, tra traumatic brain injuries. I say, well, what does we mean? What did you do? So did you build the microscope? Did you, did you prepare the animal? Did you, uh, did you make the imaging algorithm? What did you do? And so in that part of the interview, I would, I would go into more and more depth learning exactly what you did. Because saying that we image the brain could mean so many different things. So a lot of times, we're not trying to, not trying to attack you in an, in an interview by asking you lots of questions. We're simply trying to find where the, where the edges of your knowledge is and where the edge of your capabilities as far as your skills and the things that you've actually done before. So that's what we're looking for. Very good answers. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to end this interview for the sake yeah, of time. Sure. <laughs> Let's give our interviewers a hand. Okay. It's still working? Okay. Any questions on, on, the, on interviews in general? Now, my experience is going to be more skewed on the industry side. Okay. But any questions for me on interviews? Was what? Yeah, yeah. Both of you were very, very good. Very good. Yeah. I would. I would. Um, the only critical feedback I would give would be to not so freely offer the things that are maybe negative about you. Right? Say I don't like these things. Always, always be positive in the things that you say. If you don't, if you don't like harming animals, there's that's a great thing to not like harming animals. Right? But instead of making it a negative, I don't want to hurt animals. You say, I love animals, right? I, I, want, 
I want my research to be for the benefit of animals, you know, something like that. And so it's always in a positive light. <laughs> I think you also said that you didn't always work well with people. I would, I would steer, away from, steer away from that one. Because you're always going to be working with people. Even if, you're, even if you're in a lab by yourself, you're going to have a manager, somebody. Um, and I think you work OK with people. Just from our little interaction here. Don't sell yourself short. There's, have you ever heard of uh, imposter syndrome? Does that term mean anything to you, imposter syndrome? All right. Write that down and look it up later. We're not going to discuss it much here today. But this is, a, this is a problem with highly educated people, myself included, a lot of people I know. In a nutshell, it's you, you never quite feel like what you've done is good enough. Or you've never, you never quite feel like what you're doing is as good as the next person. Or someone else is always doing something better than you, and you're not, you're not as worthy to get a job or recognition as someone else is. And that's a, it's a byproduct of our mindset. We are generally high-achieving people. We always feel like we could or should be doing more. It's a, it's a product of the relationships that we have. We're, we're friends with some very high-achieving people. So we view ourselves in context of them. But keep in mind that you guys are, you, you are among the top as far as education goes, and as far as opportunities that you will have. So don't sell yourself short on your resume or in the interview process, all right? Most of you will probably not be in sales at any point in your life, but you will be in sales during the interview process because you are selling yourself, okay? So emphasize the positive and be confident in yourself. You're, you're well educated. Okay, let's see here. What do I have? So I have about 10 minutes left. What do I want to do with 10 minutes? Ooh, okay, we'll do this. So here are, uh, we'll go through a couple of things. Is it going to work? OK, good. We'll go through a couple of things that will be helpful for you going from this step to the next stage in life. All right. You've made it this far. There's only 10 minutes left. Don't fall asleep on me now. Who has heard of the term elevator pitch before? Wow, there's like five people in a cluster right there who all have and nobody else has. It's like, it's like knowledge goes through osmosis in the crowd here. It's always a circle of people that raise their hands. Um, okay, so you get in an elevator with somebody, and you have how much time to talk to that person when you're in an elevator? Maybe five to ten seconds? Okay, so this is a term used primarily in the business world. Uh, startup companies when they're pitching their ideas to investors or, or to people around them, you say you've got to develop your elevator pitch of what your company is and why anybody should care about it. Okay? I say you need to develop an elevator pitch of who you are and why anybody should care. Okay? So in five to ten seconds, you have to be able to say who you are, what you do, and why anybody should care. Okay? We struggle with this as scientists because when someone asks, you know, what do you do, we want to just dive headfirst into the technical details of everything we do. We want to start talking about plasmons, right? We want to start talking about, you know, resonances. We want to start talking about two-photon microscopy and, you know, all, all, we want to start talking about all the technical details. You ain't got time for that with most people, especially when you're at conferences, when you're at networking activities. You don't have 10 minutes to go into the weeds of everything with every person that you meet. But you want to meet a lot of people, right? So I'm going to give you two minutes right now to come up with your 5 to 10 second elevator pitch, OK? Who you are, what you do, and why anybody should care about it. Two minutes.
almost at a time. Okay, turn to the person next to you and give them your elevator pitch. I should only have to give you 30 seconds for this, right? For both of you to share. It's been a lot longer than five to 10 seconds. Okay, stop. How did we do? We get it down to five to 10 seconds? Who, okay, honestly, whose friend started getting in the technical weeds as they were explaining? Oh, I'm seeing some finger pointing going on. This guy over here, he's like, All right, and when we give it a try, where are, the, where are those microphones? We'll get we'll have two people. I want a new volunteer this time. Someone not not the same people that have volunteered every time. Come on, who's gonna who's gonna be brave? There we go. What's your name? Ash. Ash. Yeah. All right. Go uh, for it. I love visualizing the world at a small scale, and uh, I'm always hungry. I'm Hush. Cool. I like it. All right. Start with who you are, please. Hello, I'm Shannon Fortis, currently pursuing my master's in bioinformatics and hopefully soon designing software to help your life become easier. All right. Cool. Thank you. So I'll tell you, I'll tell you mine, if I can remember it, when I was a grad student. What did I say? So when I was a grad student, I think my elevator pitch was, hey, I'm Dan Christensen. We fundamentally don't understand how blood flow in the brain works. And so I develop novel microscopy techniques to better understand how that works. That's it. Who am I? I'm Dan. What am I doing? What am I doing? Building microscopes. Why do we care? Because we fundamentally don't understand how blood flow in the brain works. That's it. And then if you want to learn more, then we can talk more about it. All right. Very good. All right. That's something you might want to spend some more time on. You can, you can make a, an elevator pitch that's like five to 10 seconds. You can come up with like a one minute version of what you're doing. And then you've got you know, the whole five, 10 minute version where you really get into the technical weeds for various situations that you're in. For those of us that are, that are introverted, you know the difference between being extroverted and introverted? What's the difference between being in, extroverted and introverted? Hearing a lot of rumblings. Okay, so in general, extroverts, it, it comes from where you, your energy comes from. If at, the, if at the end of a long day, you just want to go and hang out with people and socialize, and that's how you recharge, then you're most likely an extrovert. If you want to go home and just be by yourself and just recharge alone, you're most likely an introvert, where your comfort zones are, right? Uh, especially if you're an introvert and you're more comfortable being alone and less comfortable talking to people in, in stressful situations, it's good to come up with these kinds of, these kinds of uh, pitches. Your five second pitch, your one minute pitch, your five minute pitch. This is in you have it and it's less, uh, it's less stressful for you when you're in these social type situations. 
All right, how are we doing on time? Oh boy, we're almost done. What else did I want to share with you? If you, um, this, this can be true in academia. It's certainly true in industry. When you're, when you're two to three years away, so that's like all of you, when you're two to three years away from wanting to start a job, look around, look at job openings, look for job openings that look like something you would be interested in and figure out who the hiring manager is for that job or someone in that field who would know something about that job. And then request to do an informational interview. Have you heard of this before, informational interviews? Yeah. Request to do an inf informational interview. This is a great way to kind of get yourself started with the whole interview process. You say, hey, I say, let's say it's a laser engineer job. It was one of my laser engineer jobs. You call me up and you say, hey, I'm a second year student at uh, MAHE. Uh, really interested in this position you have put up there right now. I'm not ready for it right now. I'm going to be graduating in two years, one year, two years. Uh, would you be willing to take a few minutes with me to go through, uh, to do an informational interview with me? I would say, yeah, sure. And so then we would discuss, uh, you would be leading the conversation because it'd be mostly about you saying, this is where I am. This is my resume. This is who I am. What do I need to do between now and when I graduate? to be a strong candidate for this kind of role with you, right? This accomplishes a few things. First, it gives you a roadmap of things that a company like this would be interested in, what you can do in the next couple of years to set yourself up for success. It also gets you on the, the radar. It gets you in the mind of that person who's doing it. Now they're going to be looking for you in a couple of years. They're going to see if you actually did the things that they recommended that you do, and they're going to be looking for your resume if you choose to submit it then. Or you can reach out to them again in a couple of years and say, hey, I am ready now. I did all these things. It's just still a fit for me in the company. I'd, I'd be interested in going forward, right? So if you do this a year or two in advance, it's, it's making the job of the hiring manager easier. Hiring is really hard. It takes a lot of time, whether it's in academia or industry or whatever. It takes a lot of time. It's really hard. Anything you can do to make my job easier is all the advantage to you. Get a career mentor. Find someone, so all you Jennifer Bartons out there, find someone like a Jennifer Barton. All you Davy Foots, find someone like a Davy Foot. All of you me's, you can talk to me. Um, find, find a career mentor, someone that you can, you can call up or you can email uh, as time goes by and as you're thinking of you know, decisions, if you should take this class or that class or if you should do this internship or that one or just in general, you know, that I want to be more like you. This is where I am. What should I do? What should the next steps in my career be? You know, someone who, who's willing to help you out along the way. Find a career mentor. And this is, this is one of those catch-all phrases I like to say. This is what I've done in my life and found, found a lot of success in it, and I think you will too. We say, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks, especially now as you're young. And by that, <clears throat> that I mean, just try everything, you know? Try, um, try volunteering in different groups. Try, uh, you know, being part of different organizations. Go to different conferences if you can. Hey, you're here. You know, talk to all different types of people. Um, I, 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 like, I wrote white papers for companies in the area just to see what it was like to do that, uh, just for free. I, I volunteered and helped out in a few labs in the university just to see what it was like working in those different research labs and uh, just, you know, a few hours a week. Um, uh, I volunteered at, at OSA and SPIE, uh, got involved in some, uh, some uh, committees there just to see what those were like, uh, you know, wrote papers, you know, go through that exercise. Try everything. Try everything at least once. See if you like it or not. You might be surprised, right? Uh, throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Okay. I think we're out of time. Let me leave this with you then. This is one more resource that you have as a member of OSA. If you're not a member of OSA, I'd encourage you to become a, a member. They have this resource online. It's called the Career Calibrator. It's put together with this guy. He calls himself the Cheeky Scientist. Um, but it's a, it's a whole way of kind of going through and doing some of the things that we did here today. 
but it um, you build a profile and uh, it goes through like interview process. It goes through your resume. I mean, it goes through a whole bunch of different stuff. So go set up, go set this up. If you were to pay for the service yourself, it's like super expensive. So this is offered to you for free as a member of OSA. Uh, highly recommend you go on and just check it out. All right, uh, career calibrator. Let's see. Anything else? That's really it. Thank you. Was that useful? Is that helpful? Okay. Can I do one more thing with you before we finish? Okay. My, uh, my wife always makes fun of me because, well, <laughs> for many reasons, but one of them is that uh, I'm, I'm always, anywhere I go anywhere, anytime I do anything, I'm always sending her selfies. So we're going to take a selfie together, all right? All right, everybody ready? Oh, wait, that's not selfie. There we go. All right, ready? I got to go out further here? All right. Okay, I think we got most everybody. Oh, I got to get it. There we go. One, two, three. You guys are awesome. Thank you. I can, I can imagine the conversation with my wife now. She's going to be like, you really took a selfie on the stage with everybody? Like, yes, of course. You guys have been great. Thank you. So much participation. This is, this is so much more fun with a group like you that actually participates and you talk to each other and you go through the activities with me. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was indeed a wonderful and a very interactive talk, and I'm sure everyone enjoyed and yet learned a lot. It was a great pleasure having you here for this session. I would now like to invite Dr. K.K. Mahato, HOD, Department of Biophysics in School of Life Sciences, as well as the faculty advisor, Manipal OSA student chapter, to present a memento as a token of gratitude to Dr. Christensen on behalf of Manipal OSA student chapter. Thank you, sir. So we have a short break right now. You may proceed towards the venue for tea and coffee, and we'll gather here after 15 minutes for the next session. Thank you. <laughs>